Hello, and thank you all for coming here. My name is Artemy Kolchinsky, and I'm a researcher at the Santa Fe Institute. Before proceeding, I would like to thank our sponsors. First and foremost, we want to thank Thornburg Investment Management for generously underwriting SFI's community lecture series. Without their funding, these lectures would not be possible. We also want to thank the Lenzig Performing Arts Center for allowing us to host these lectures in this beautiful space. <laughs> Lastly, we want to thank Enterprise Holdings Foundation for their recent renewed support. In today's lecture, we will hear from Dr. Chris Monroe. Dr. Monroe is a leading atomic physicist and quantum information scientist. He received his undergraduate degree in physics from MIT, his PhD in physics from the University of Colorado Boulder. He then did postdoctoral work and uh, worked as a resident researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And while working there in the mid-90s, he demonstrated the first quantum logic gate, an essential component of quantum computers. Chris is currently a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. He is a member of the Joint Quantum Institute and the Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science. Among various other awards, Chris is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, beyond that, today I learned that Chris is also a percussionist in the Columbia Symphony Orchestra in Columbia, Maryland. And he has even manufactured some instruments for this orchestra, such as a machine that makes wind noises. <laughs> and is now in his garage. <laughs> This talk is part of the SFI Community Lecture Series. This series allows researchers, both from the Institute and from afar, to share their ideas and cutting edge research with the broad public. Today's talk connects with several recent community lectures, which concern fundamental questions in physics and computation. This includes past events such as an interdisciplinary panel on the nature of time with Sean Carroll, James Hartle, and David Krakauer, a lecture by Dr. Sabine Hassenfelder, which considered the relationship between aesthetics and the search for fundamental physical laws, and not least, the most recent lectures by SFI's own Chris Moore on the limits of computers in science and society, which was a wonderful introduction to the ideas behind the theory of computation and the growing impact of computing and machine learning on society. And before proceeding, I'd like to tell you that the next lecture in this series, which will be the last one of the season, uh, will take place on November 13th. It will be Michelle Gervin who will talk about predicting chaos with machine learning, uh, which is another fascinating topic on the frontier of computer science. So today's lecture will be about quantum computers, which are computers which operate according to the principles of quantum physics. Quantum computation is one of the most exciting and active and maybe hyped uh, research fields in physics and in computer science. And at the same time, the development of large-scale quantum computers may hold the potential to revolutionize technology, science, and society. Uh, apart from the applications, in my opinion, it is one of the most intellectually exciting areas uh, in contemporary science because understanding the relationship between physics and computation involves far more than the simple application of physical knowledge to engineering problems. Rather, we increasingly see information and computation as central principles that underlie much of the structure of statistical physics and quantum physics. For this reason, understanding the relationship between computation and physics is as much about desi designing the next generation of computers as it is about understanding the fundamental nature of reality. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Monroe. Okay, thank, thank, you, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, lovely to be here, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it gets us started right off. Being Santa Fe, I thought uh, I would start, I, I, have, I have lots of pretty pictures, not too many equations. Um, the topic is indeed quantum computers, so we're going to have to delve into what uh, we're going to have to delve into quantum physics, which has a sort of mystical following. And I'll tell you right off that you're not going to leave today understanding 
any more about quantum physics than you had before. On the other hand, I hope you're going to leave with, with the knowledge that you don't need to. <laughs> and that, that's maybe the point here. <laughs> Another way to say it is that, um, is that Al Einstein didn't believe in it. And so we're in, we're in good company if we don't believe in it either. It's not about believing. It's a, it's a very interesting theory, but uh, it does call into question what, what is science and, and, and what, is, uh, what is religion, in a sense. Um, uh, for quantum physics, uh, calls us to basically define what reality is, which is very strange. And so I'm a working experimental phys physicist, likes to work on cars and build things. And to come up against such uh, very high level philosophical thoughts is uh, interesting to say the least. But I'm of the opinion that I use the theory because it works very well. Uh, and uh, m maybe uh, you'll indulge me in this story about how, how this strange theory might uh, play a role in our ability to compute. This is a painting uh, one of my uh, former students uh, gave to me about 15 years ago, Boris Blinov, and he's at uh, Washington, Seattle now. And at the time, so I'm an atomic physicist, I work with individual atoms, and we, um, th they're wonderful test beds for, for quantum physics experiments, including quantum computing. And at the time Boris worked in our laboratory, we were, we were um, playing around with individual cadmium atoms. Why cadmium? Because they had certain features that uh, were amenable to what we wanted to do. And if you're an oil painter, you know that, that the, the uh, bright yellow pigment in oil paints is cadmium. It's called cadmium yellow. So he, he, um, he painted this for me. And I, he, he didn't want to interpret it, uh, but he, uh, I interpret this as being two cadmium atoms. And they're entangled. And I'll uh, talk a little later about what entanglement means, but that's what this stuff is. <laughs> It's sort of the fabric of space. It's, uh, and I don't mean to sound mystical, but entanglement is rather mystical. Uh, you, you can lose your mind thinking about it too much. Um, so that's, that's a painting of two cadmium atoms. And, and uh, at, at the end of the lecture, I'll talk a little bit about how individual atoms might play a role in uh, the next, next generation uh, uh, computers to do certain tasks. So following our, our uh, uh, exhaustive introduction into the topic of computing and information, um, as a physicist, uh, I, I've found that this topic is, is, is great fun because we don't usually think about physics and information as necessarily mixing. But in every case, when you think of information, what it is, how you store information, it is physical. It could be a switch that's in the on or off position. We tend to think of bits. Uh, the basic unit of information has two states, 0 and 1. You can store, uh, you, you can use other bases if you would like, but 0 and 1 are sufficient, so we tend to use that. It could be an electrical current going one way or the other way, on, off. Anything that can be in two states can act as a bit and store information, magnetic storage. It, uh, the, the, the uh, direction of a, of a small magnet, whether it's pointing up or down. Well, information is physical. And all of the computers that we've had since the beginning of computation, which was a long time ago, have been based on physical principles. This is a picture um, many of you have probably seen. The first digital computer in this country is called ENIAC. was developed uh, in the, in the mid-20th century. It was used for the defense industry to calculate missile trajectories and so forth. But this machine, it's pretty unwieldy. It, uh, it was composed of vacuum tubes. These were the switching elements that would, that would store zeros and ones. Um, now, what's interesting is a computer, when you use computers, you don't really think of what's inside of them. And that's the beauty of information theory. It doesn't matter what's inside as long as they obey certain, certain types of rules, whether they store electrical currents or magnetic little magnetic uh, uh, domains in a, in a hard drive, for instance, or even optical disks. They store uh, little pits that can reflect light in two different, two different ways. So uh, there is a beautiful picture in the, in the advertisement for this talk um, that, uh, of this, th this picture here. This is the first solid state transistor. And it's interesting, 1947, it was right after ENIAC was unveiled. It's a radically different type of a medium and in fact, it doesn't look very, doesn't look very stable. Um, this is, uh, th this uh, dark piece of glass, it looks like glass, it's actually called germanium. It's a semiconductor. 
it doesn't really conduct very well unless you do something to it. And what, what they're doing to this, there's a piece of glass with a little gold film and it's pressed against the germanium. And when you, when you apply a signal on this gold, the germanium conducts current very well. When you turn that signal off, it doesn't conduct. So it's, a, it's a, an electronically controlled electronic switch. Uh, it doesn't look like the basis of all computation in, in over the last 60 years, but it is, the solid state transistor. Because it's solid state and not a bulky vacuum tube, it could be, it could be shrunk down in size, down to really tiny uh, dimensions. And that, uh, I, I wish we could talk more about the, the, the beautiful work that has <laughs> taken this big uh, unwieldy mess into little tiny transistor elements that are part of uh, modern computers these days. So you've probably heard of Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel. Uh, and, and back in the day, in the 50s and 60s, he and, and, and others uh, aimed to, to engineer this system so it would work well. Well, it worked very well. They, got, they were able to make them really small. And over the course of time, this Moore's Law uh, represents the growth in the number of transistors, the number of these things, on a single chip over the course of the last few decades. This is a, this is an exponent, this is a log plot, meaning every line is a factor of 10. So this is called exponential growth. Every, every decade we get about a factor of 10 uh, more transistors, and nowadays this is even a little outdated. Nowadays we're at 10 billion uh, transistors in a chip, a, a, a few, uh, you know, inch, an inch or two on a side. Well, it's interesting, I'm talking about Moore's Law. This is, has really nothing to do with quantum, uh, quantum physics. You might argue there is some quantum physics happening right at this little interface, but it's not really needed to understand the basic principles here. But this is going to, Moore's Law, because it's ending, is going to um, indeed motivate the use of quantum physics to, for a new mode of computing. Well, why is it ending? Actually, it's pretty simple. The transistor is getting so small that if, I f if we follow this line for another couple of decades, each transistor will be the size of an atom. And at that point, there's no more making it smaller unless you want to split the atom inside your computer. And I don't think that's going to that's happen. That takes a lot of energy. So Moore's Law, in fact, this laptop I bought, uh, actually I just bought last year, but the laptop I bought before this three years ago was about as powerful. Um, the batteries are better. The display is better. But the computing prowess of, of processors is already showing signs of saturating. You probably recognize that yourself. So what are we going to do? I mean, Moore's Law, you could argue this exponential growth was the engine behind the information era, behind the economy in the last 50, 60, 70 years. What are we going to do? Well, let's talk about quantum mechanics because, in fact, why Moore's Law is ending is, in a sense, because matter is granular and we have to confront uh, dealing with individual atoms as circuit elements. So I'm going to quote uh, Richard Feynman, who has a proud history in this area of the country, of course, uh, during World War II. He's also one of the father figures of quantum physics. And he had a speech a long time ago called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Um, and he, he, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a three or four page lecture. It's just wonderful. And there, there's gems everywhere, but my favorite paragraph is right here, and he's, I think he's stimulated by these solid state devices that can be made really small. And he says, well, when you make things really small, we get down to the size of individual atoms, there's a completely new opportunity for design. Why? Well, when you get down to single atoms, when, it, when you get down to the very simple granular part of matter, that system obeys a new law of physics. It's not really a new law, but it's, it's laws emerge that are different than, than, than what we use for baseballs and, and things that we see in everyday life. Those are the laws of quantum mechanics. Now, Feynman didn't know what these opportunities would be, but he, he, um, he was a visionary, and this is so long ago, it took many decades for us to find what those opportunities are. And um, I, I think the, the, <laughs> the verdict is in that that opportunity is quantum computing. So I want to talk about that. To do that, we have to talk about quantum physics. So I'm going to try to teach you quantum physics in about five minutes. And, and you shouldn't laugh, because the, the, the precepts of quantum physics are very simple. There's, the problem is that there's two of them. And you can't derive one from the other. 
Now in physics, we like to think of ourselves as the king of science. So we have to have one law at the very top. Everything derives from that law, even if it's very hard to, 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 to actually do that, to, to derive how a baseball will fly through the air based on particle physics. We're comfortable in the fact that a baseball is made of particles. We could do that if we had to. So the principle at the very top, there's the standard model, or in Newtonian physics, force equals mass times acceleration. You can derive almost everything, indeed everything, in, in classical mechanics using that very simple law. Well, the problem with quantum mechanics, and this is why physicists hate it, is that there are two laws. There's like two peaks, and you can't get from one to the other. They're two separate rules. But once you accept those two rules, <laughs> or you're comfortable using them, everything's okay. Just, uh, it's, it's more of a sociological thing, I think, why, why people are afraid of quantum physics. So there are two rules of quantum physics, and I would say these are the, going to give this opportunity that Feynman prefaced a long time ago. What are they? The golden rules of quantum mechanics, there's two of them. The first one, you've probably heard this, is that everything is a wave. Well, quantum physics is a, it, quantum mechanics is a wave theory. We're, we're familiar with lots of wave theories. Mechanical waves, sound waves, water waves. And we understand that a wave is sort of an oscillation that travels in space, but also in time. If you, if you take a picture of, an, of a wave, like if you take a picture of water waves, you'll see sort of a ripple. But if you also stay at a particular point on the surface of the ocean, the water will also ripple up and down in time and space. And there are differential equations to describe waves. Um, they can get nasty, but that math doesn't necessarily help you understand everything. Um, just the concepts of a wave, we know it when we see it. So one of the properties of waves that we're very comfortable with is that they can be in superpositions. When you play two notes on a piano, your ear can experience both of those sound waves at the same time. No problem, and your brain can resolve those tones in general. Um, water waves can have many different, can be very complicated, and you can see many different structures on the surface of the ocean, for instance. So the idea of, when, when, you, throw, when you throw a rock into a pond, we, we, we know that we'll have these circular waves emanating from, this, from the core. Where is the wave? Well, it's everywhere. It, it's delocalized is the technical term. So waves can be in superposition. Now, I'm going to apply this to information. Remember the bit, the zero or one? Well, if we apply it to information, we should, if, if, if we're going to say everything's a wave, well, we can have information in waveform. We can have both zero and one at the same time. So this is a little jargon, and I don't want to avoid the, the jargon of quantum mechanics, because if you ever see that line and a little bracket next to it, that means this is, this is a quantum thing. It's a quantum state. We use that all the time. And this is um, what we might call a qubit, a quantum bit. It's a superposition of something that can be in one state and another state. And I've chosen zero and one just as labels. You can call it up and down, left and right, heads or tails, doesn't matter. And the plus sign is not your usual plus sign. It means that there's, they're both there together. You can't just add these like, like arithmetic. They're both there, like maybe uh, one, one note on a piano and another note on a piano. And these parameters A and B are the weightings of how much one and how much zero there are. It could be 50-50 or 90-10. So this is the simplest superposition we can have, just of two, two levels. Now here's a, pic, a depiction, a pretty poor depiction of an atom that has one electron on it orbiting the core. That one electron is in two orbits at the same time. And atoms can do that because the electrons are waves. And we have to take a little bit of a leap that, that matter can behave as a wave, but we should be comfortable with the idea of, of this wave-like phenomenon. Now, here's where the math comes in, but again, don't be bogged down by the math. A and B follow a wave equation called the Schrodinger wave equation. I'm not going to talk about it at all. It, it can get very messy. But all waves have equations. It doesn't have to be just quantum. This is no more complicated than water waves. Okay? So there's math behind A and B. And you can change the weightings, A and B, if you, if you poke the system just right. And I'm talking about water waves a lot. This is, uh, of course, the, the, the famous great wave off uh, Kanagawa painting, uh, this great wave. And we all know what's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, uh, to these poor folks in that boat there. Um, the mathematics behind this wave is very complicated. I would say it's even more complicated than the quantum wave. 
And you know, I don't even know how to solve, I don't know exactly what these all mean. I think they have to do with viscosity and what the wave's going to do over space and time. That math doesn't give us any more insight in this wave, at least not me. I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> I think we all know what's gonna happen. When waves come into the shore at the beach, the, the water gets shallower and the waves actually get higher and they get slower. Um, we, just, we just understand that. We don't need a wave equation to understand that. So that's, that's my advice. You don't get bothered by the math. Okay, that was rule number one. I spent a little too long on it. Um, but what about rule number two? What does it mean to have a superposition? Well, a quantum superposition means that the, the existence of something is in two states at the same time. This cup, in principle, if it's quantum, it can be in two places at the same time. That's okay according to quantum mechanics, but it's not okay according to real world experience. So we have to invent another rule. And this is what drives people crazy, is that we have this other rule, and this is a little bit of a joke the way I state it, but the rule number two says, yeah, that superposition stuff's fine as long as you don't look. And so this cup, nothing wrong with the cup being in two places. We don't experience it, but it only works if you don't look at it. But actually, that, if, you, if you think about quantum mechanics from that perspective, you can go a long way. And I'm gonna define what it means to look, and I'm not gonna define consciousness either, believe it or not, because uh, looking at something doesn't have to involve a living body. And let me, let me explain what I mean there. What happens when you do look? And of course, if we're gonna build a computer based on these bits, we're gonna wanna measure the answer. We have to look. So what happens when we look at a quantum superposition? Well, that's where the weightings play a role because when we do look, the system randomly pops into one or the other definite state with a probability attached to it. And the probability is given by A and B. It's not exactly A and B, but you can think of it that way. So if we have a 50-50 superposition, then half the time we're going to see zero, half the time we're gonna see one. And if we repeat it over and over again, it's like flipping a coin. It's going to be random and noisy. This should really bother you. This is rule number two. By the way, this is it. That's quantum physics. Done. I, I think I took like seven or eight minutes, sorry. Um, but this rule number two is very strange. I think of it as being strange on two accounts. Number one, it appears that by looking at something, you change it. And that's, that's a, a totally foreign concept to all of science. We expect if there's an experiment running, it's going to do the same thing whether we look or not. But quantum physics says that by extracting information, that's a little more technical, but by looking at a system, it, it appears to change it. Another way to think of this rule number two as weird is that where did the probabilities come from anyway? What are probabilities? Well, you all know what probabilities are. We use them all the time when we're ignorant, when we're ignorant of something or we don't want, we're too lazy to characterize everything. We don't wanna uh, calculate the trajectory of every molecule in the air to predict the weather. In principle, some would argue we can't anyway, but I, I think in principle we, we, we could. It might be a chaotic system, and my Maryland colleague, Michelle Gervin, will tell you more about that next month, about chaos. Um, but probabilities, uh, like flipping a coin, I could calculate the results of any coin toss if I know precisely how hard I toss it, precisely the value of gravity, and so forth. Humidity, temperature, all that stuff. But I don't want to. I'm lazy, I'm ignorant, so we use probabilities. We're comfortable using but we're not going to. Quantum physics is the only theory in all of nature where we can't do that. We have to use probabilities. And that's weird. Whenever probabilities are there, you wanna wonder, well, who's cooking the books? Who decides in a measurement what, what you get? It's a good question. <laughs> and it's really why Einstein didn't believe in this theory. You know, many of his famous lines, uh, one of them, God does not play dice. So there's something in the background that seems to be playing dice here. So what about consciousness? What about looking? I, uh, w when you look, what if there's no human or no consciousness to observe something? Well, we have an answer for that too, or at least we, we, we think of things in a very funny way uh, in, in quantum superpositions. Remember my cup in two places. Well, let's say I have that cup in two places. But that's tricky because now the air in the room has to, has to reorganize itself depending on where the cup is. If the cup's over here, 
there's definitely no air where the cup is, because the cup's there. And there's air over here. But if the cup's over here, the reverse is true. So the air has to sort of get involved. Well, let's get rid of the air. Pump out all the air. And let's say there's one air molecule, one nitrogen molecule, it's, it's zipping on the stage here. And it's going to hit this cup only when it's here. But if the cup's here, it's going to go right through. Well, if the cup's here, the, the air, the nitrogen molecule is going to bounce off this cup, say, and hit that wall. But if the cup's here, the air is going to go straight through. So the air, that molecule has to make a decision. But it doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't have a free will, we don't think. It's just a, it's just a nitrogen molecule. So what, how do we deal with this? Well, if we made the trouble of uh, uh, having this cup in two places, we can add one more molecule to the system. So let's have the molecule also being in a superposition of going that way, correlated with the cup here, and going that way, correlated with the cup here. But we're not done, because this molecule hits that wall and that wall. So now the, the, the walls are part of the system. Yeah, let's invite them, they're part. The whole building shakes one way and the other way. The building, yes, come on, we're, we're all here. Uh, well, the earth moves one way or the other. So you see the problem is these superpositions tend to blow up, and we have to, like predicting the weather, we have to know the state of everything in the universe. And in practice, we can't do that. So what we do, and here's how we deal with it. We box up this cup, and we say it's perfectly isolated, and nobody's looking. There's no light. There's no air. There's no information as to where this cup is leaking out. So you can see right away, there's, there's, a, there's a very deep connection between quantum measurement and information. So maybe no surprise, it should be used for computing. But it's such a fun topic. You, you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat which is another of the, uh, uh, of the rebellions against quantum physics back in 1935. Uh, Schrodinger uh, made up this, this he, he even called it a ridiculous case of, of what quantum might predict. Here we have a single atom, and the way he posed it, it's a radioactive atom, and if you wait one half-life of the radioactive atom, it's in a superposition of having decayed and having not decayed. That's how we treat the single atom quantum mechanically, a radioactive one. Well, he hooks a single atom up to a Geiger counter. That's perfect. It, it registers a click if it decays. And that Geiger counter is hooked to a hammer that smashes a flask of poison, cyanide. Um, and so there's a cat in the box, by the way. And the cat, therefore, is both alive and dead at the same time. Um, and he says, quite ridiculous case. It is ridiculous because we're, we don't. I mean, a cat has lots of atoms, 10 to the 22 atoms in there. And we, it's very hard to, to think of a cat as a quantum system. It's too, many, too much stuff there. So it's very hard to apply, just like, just like the air hitting the walls and the building getting involved, it's very hard to isolate such a big system. And when I look at this thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, you know, the hardest part of the experiment, it's not the atom or the Geiger counter or the cat, it's actually the box because you have to isolate it from everything. Um, so it brings, you know, there's lots of thought experiments like that. Um, and we can, if we ascribe quantum mechanics to the system, we have an atom that's in one state correlated with the cat alive, and it's in the other state, cat's dead. This, I'm gonna comment a little more on this kind of a quantum state. It's just a superposition of two situations. It's also called entangled, and I'll get to that in a minute. So here you can sort of go off the deep end, and uh, in quantum physics there are lots of interpretations as to what really happens. Um, the problem with interpretations is that they all predict the same answer in any conceivable experiment, so the differences between interpretations to me is not necessarily science. It's very interesting. I love reading about those. Here's one interpretation. You've probably heard of this, and it's a very neat one. It says that, that rule number two, remember that, that when you measure you get one or the other. Well, let's just say the universe bifurcates at that point. And if we say that, everything is neatly tied up because we only see a definite answer in our universe and our alter ego sees the other, the other answer in the other universe. So I guess that works. It works for some people. To me, it, to me, it has a big expense because <laughs> now we have to think about all these universes and there's not just two of them. There's a gazillion universes every time a quantum system gets resolved. How to keep track of that? It, until we can travel between those universes, it's very hard to think of this as a, as a 
I don't know how to test this, so it's hard to call it science. Um, but some people say, well, it's the only thing, it, it, by, you know, if you, eliminate all, <laughs> if you eliminate everything else, it's the only thing that makes sense. Um, Einstein, in the same year, 1935, this title, his papers are wonderful, uh, very, very easy to read them. Uh, his title here is basically, is quantum mechanics even right? It seems like somebody's cooking the books, there's other stuff going on. And he, for the first time, uh, uh, introduced the idea of an entangled state. What does that mean? Well, here now, we have two qubits. This is the simplest version of an entangled state. Two qubits, a red one and a blue one. And they're prepared, you can think of two coins if you want, both heads and both tails. So it's a superposition. If we're going to allow superpositions, this is not a big deal here, right? We're allowing a superposition of these two situations. What's interesting about this particular superposition is that the red and the blue system are different. They're separate. In fact, they can be spatially separated. They can be, you can take the red one on the moon if you want and leave the blue one here. And what's neat there is that if, if I look at the blue one here on Earth, whatever I measure, I know exactly what the one on the moon has. If I measure a zero, remember this is a 50-50 superposition. If I measure a zero, I know that the moon qubit is also zero. And what bothered Einstein in particular is that I know that information faster than light could, could have beamed the information to me. So that's strange. He called it, another one of his famous quotes, he called it spooky action at a distance. <laughs> and therefore, it must be wrong. There must be something going on. It turns out, um, I think his heart was in the right place. It's just super weird. But quantum mechanics, as far as we know, is correct. We can make entangled states and make measurements on them faster than information could be communicated. The trick is, there, if you think about this from information theory point of view, and information theory was not really invented until the early 40s. Um, the resolution of this so-called EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paradox, is that if you do this many times, and you should imagine I have a bunch of coins numbered, and you have a bunch of coins numbered, and they're all entangled, they're all the same value, but each one of them is random. If we repeat it, we're just gonna get random numbers. I'm not gonna learn any information that you could encode in your system by measuring mine. All I know is I have the same random bit you do. And random bit streams contain no information. So the resolution of EPR paradox is from information theory, actually. So it doesn't violate any physics principles, this idea of entanglement. But it's still kind of cool. There's some kind of a connection between these qubits. I think of entanglement as wires without wires, wiring without wires. And these correlations, as we'll maybe get a hint at, they're behind all the power of quantum computing. Um, okay, so there's only one analogy I know of entanglement, and it's based on an, uh, a, a visual illusion. And so let me just go through that quickly. So you all uh, gone through the exercise of trying to draw a cube on a 2D surface, on a chalkboard. And in fact, I've drawn this incorrectly. I've drawn this so all the lines are exactly parallel, so it has ambiguous perspective. Where's the front face? Is it this one or is it that one? Is it up and to the right or down and to the left? That's a little like a superposition. You, you can sort of see it flipping back and forth. It has both. But then when you sort of lock onto one perspective, it stays that way. That's sort of like a measurement. And the beauty of this, there, here are the two uh, definite perspectives, of course. The beauty of this, this analogy is it works for entanglement. Here are two qubits, both zeros and both ones. And I'll bet you when you resolve the perspective, they're the same. You can try to trick it, but it's very hard to do that. It's only an analogy. But uh, uh, th the fact that these two sort of shimmer back and forth together is the essence of entanglement. And they're connected even though they're not connected. <laughs> they're connected by our consciousness, I guess. But it's a little bit like the mystery of entanglement. And there are the two definite perspectives. And unfortunately, this analogy falls apart when you get them too far apart. Now, because they're too far apart, the, the visual illusion d disappears. Okay, so I want to talk for a few minutes on what a quantum computer is. Well, it's a collection of qubits, clearly. We're going to be storing, we're going to be storing superpositions of numbers. And um, so there, there's a few numbers on this next slide, but the high level is, is pretty clear. We're going to put a lot of qubits together and see what happens. And I think of it as a good news, bad news, good news story. <laughs> 
And the last piece of good news is only recent, the last decade or two, the last couple of decades. What's the good news? Well, when we put lots of qubits together, the system sort of blows up exponentially. Why? Because um, one qubit can store two values, zero and one. Two qubits can store four values, right? Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. Three qubits can store eight numbers. N qubits can store two to the N binary numbers. All right, so this is an illustration of three qubits and we have eight numbers and the shading of gray tells you sort of how much zero there is, how much two there is, how much seven there is and so forth. So this is really good news because you can do parallel processing in a way that you only have one input but the input has all the numbers at the same time, as long as you don't look. <laughs> so, so you have to compute this function in the dark, no information leaking out and so forth. But in principle we can do that and we can get all these answers. Here's a quantum state of three qubits. It has eight weight weightings and they should all add up to one because the probabilities have to add up. Well, eight is not very big, so three qubits is a pretty small system. But if I put four qubits in here, we get 16. Five qubits is 32, so we have exponential growth. If we put 300 qubits together, that's two to the 300 states we can represent. And I picked that number because it's huge. It's more than the number of atoms in the universe. So even if every atom in the universe is part of a regular PC like this, or, or some conventional computer, it wouldn't have enough space to store information merely in 300 atoms, or 300 electrons in a quantum computer. So this is the really good news. It's explosive good news, this exponential growth. We're tempted to say, well, there's a solution to Moore's law. We have this exponential growth. Well, what's the bad news? We have to look at it. <laughs> we have to measure the quantum computer. And when you, when you make a measurement, you only, you only get one answer. You could have two to the 300, 10 to the 90 inputs, you only get one answer, and it's random. <laughs> it's totally noisy. So it's almost like it's really bad news. <laughs> it's devastating news because it seems like there's nothing good that can come from this. You don't know what the output was, because it's probabilistic, you have to reverse the function to find out what input corresponded to that output. So why not just run it serially with every one of the inputs? So at first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything to be gained here. But at second glance, and this took 30 or 40 years after Feynman's original observation of this quantum opportunity, uh, David Deutsch, a uh, computer scientist, physicist, mathematician at Oxford, uh, pointed out that, well, before you make a measurement, you can take all of these inputs, all these qubits, there may be two to the 300 of them, sorry, two to the 300 um, uh, uh, pieces of information, you can have them interfere in superposition. That's another wave-like phenomenon, interference. Well, if these, if, if these, this is sort of, be, sort of like time going from left to right, and these red dots are called quantum gates, just like in classical computing, we combine information in ways to do computation. We can do that with quantum gates and quantum states as well. There are some algorithms where if you allow them to interfere in just the right way, only one answer appears at the end, or just a few answers, before you measure. And so now that, that answer can, in some cases, depend on all of these inputs. And that's something you could never do with conventional computers if the inputs are sufficiently large. Okay? And now when you make a measurement, there's rule number two is no problem. Now when you make a measurement, there's only one answer you're going to get. And it can depend on all the inputs in an important way. I'm being kind of vague here because quantum computers are not a panacea. They, are not, they won't solve every problem. This is a so-called one-to-one -one problem where every input gives a unique output. Quantum computers are bad for that. <laughs> for the obvious reason that, as I said, this bad news will kill you. But there are problems that are not one-to-one. -one where some output depends on lots of inputs. And in, in the mid-90s, a killer application emerged that really gave birth to this field as we know it today. And it's a, actually a simple uh, recipe in, in, uh, in, in number theory, factoring. Factoring numbers. 39 is three times 13. That's easy, it's a small number. But when you make the number big that you want to factor into its primes, it becomes exponentially hard. There's no known fast algorithm to, to factor big numbers. So with, with a thousand digits, you just can't factor it. 
Now, factoring seems sort of esoteric, except the inability to factor big numbers is the basis of all modern encryption standards. <laughs> so if you can factor big numbers, you can break codes. And there are lots of three-letter agencies that want to do that. Well, actually, it's interesting. They, they, don't, they not just want to break codes. They want to know, can somebody else break our codes? When will a quantum computer exist that's powerful enough to factor? Um, and well, the good news, in a sense, is that I think we're um, a conversation last night with my sister, who is a computer scientist at Los Alamos here in Santa Fe, and she said, well, it's always 20 years away. It's 20 years away all the time. Um, <laughs> well, factoring is a really hard problem. You need millions of qubits, billions of operations, is in a, and as I'll tell you in a little bit, the state of the art now is dozens and hundreds, not millions and billions. So we're a long way away. But the way factoring works is, if you imagine uh, th th we want to factor the number 39, well, we store all of those numbers at the same time. And how would you factor classically? One not so efficient way is to test every number smaller than, uh, smaller than you, you don't have to go above the square root of 39, but every number smaller than the number, just test and see if it divides it. It's trial and error. And of course, if this, if this number has 100 digits, then you have to test 10 to the 100 numbers and you're, you're out of luck. But we can store a superposition of all these numbers in a quantum computer, and, and here's where sort of the magic happens. We can, we can apply quantum gates in the system so that the quantum state ends up being this. It sort of gets forced into the answer. And that number 39 is encoded in this particular pattern of these gates. And that's the art of quantum computing algorithms. And again, this is a killer application. It's a big deal because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fast algorithm on a quantum computer. It's exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm. Um, <clears throat> so there, there are some other applications that over the last few years have come to light, and I'm gonna be very vague here. They have to do with optimization. Any kind of problem where the answer depends on all the inputs is something that quantum may be good at. Uh, this is a very spiky function. You can think of it as a topographical map or something. What's the minimum value of this function as a function of these two variables? Well, it's clearly right here. You can see that. But what if we have, what if we have uh, 10,000 variables? We, it's very hard to plot that since we only have three dimensions. Um, so what's the minimum value of a function that has lots of inputs? Well, you have to test every one of them, and that's a hard problem. Well, the minimum is a global property of all the inputs, and there are qu quantum computer algorithms that might allow us to approximate where that minimum value is. And this is gonna hit, this could hit all kinds of different walks of life. Um, uh, uh, any kind of optimization problem, there, is, there are people thinking about how to apply quantum computers to it. That said, it's a very speculative game. It's not clear how, how well quantum computers will do in these problems. One of my favorites is um, a, a well-known problem called the traveling salesman problem. If you, specify a bunch of cities on a map, what's the, what's the path that hits every city once and only once and covers the minimum distance? That's a really hard problem uh, classically. In fact, it's exponentially hard with the number of cities. Quantum mechanically, it looks like a quantum computer might not be able to solve it either, but it might get a better approximation than a classical uh, algorithm could. And this is sort of where a lot of the field is right now. This is an article just a couple months ago in the Wall Street Journal it's nothing about quantum, it's about models. Um, for instance, autonomous driving. We have models of how cars can recognize certain things on the road. Solving some of those models are, are really difficult. And that's, I think, maybe where quantum will play, play, play a role. So I wanna I want close by actually, you know, I, I haven't talked anything about experiment. And I'm an experimentalist, and I, I've given you sort of an exotic platform for computing and remember that a quantum system to, 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 be, to, to work as a quantum computer has to be isolated to an extreme level. And then when you're ready to measure it, you need to look in there. So we have to have very controllable hardware to do this, and it's really exotic stuff. There exist a few different types of systems that can be built now for quantum computers, and in fact, two platforms in particular, they're very exotic, they're being built right now. One is superconducting circuits, and I think of this as sort of a coil of wire where the current flows without resistance. So it flows forever uh, 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 without bumping into any material. It's a fascinating physics um, uh, phenomena, phenomenon that was discovered a long time ago, superconductivity, you've heard the terms. 
Well, in this case, we can run current in two directions at the same time, and nobody's looking. And you know, even the matter in the wire is not looking because the, 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 the electricity flows without resistance. So that's an interesting platform to store a qubit, and you can physically wire these things up. This is actually five qubits. This is an IBM chip here, where they wire five superconducting qubits. And there's lots of investment in this area from big companies that you've heard of to build quantum computers out of this. There's another platform that is really sticking out as well. This is even more exotic, and this is the one I work with. Um, it's individual atoms. And the strength of individual atoms is that they're all the same. They're given to us. They're all the same, same element, same isotope, so we can scale up in a way that you could never do if you have man-made man -made qubits. And so um, this is a picture of one of our devices. This is a chip. It's a silicon chip, about a centimeter on the side. There's nothing quantum about this chip. What's quantum is the floating atoms above the chip. In fact, I've expanded it by maybe a factor of 50. These atoms sit right here above the surface, about a tenth of a millimeter above that surface, and here you can see there are 75 atoms in that chain. Each dot is a single atom. They're all the same. And the reason you can see them is that we're shining laser light on them. And that laser is tuned to a particular wavelength that this particular atom will respond to. If you want to know what the atom is, it's ytterbium. Why be? It really doesn't matter so much. It, that, that determines the lasers we're going to use and so forth. They're separated by a few microns few millionths of a meter. These are ions. They're charged, and that's why they repel each other and, and, and form this crystal. It's an atomically perfect crystal, and each atom is a qubit. Why can you see single atoms? Well, because this is in a vacuum. There's nothing there. There's nothing else there. Of course, you can see things if there's no noise. Um, so, so these atoms behave as wonderful qubits, quantum bits, and we can, we can actually shine lasers on them to, to, uh, to perform quantum computations. And this little animation will kind of show you about that. So this is just a collection of five atoms. We initialize them using other lasers. And we're going to poke lasers at these individual atoms. You should think of them as like masses connected by springs. And when we, when we, when we poke them with lasers, they move around a little bit. And that causes them to be coupled. That's how we wire together the atoms. And this is actually a quantum computation, a circuit here. And we point lasers at the atoms. I won't go into details. Uh, don't have time to do that. But in the end, we do a quantum computation based on those gates, and then we measure them all. If it's in one state, they fluoresce. If it's in another state, they're dark. And we collect that light on detectors. So this is a very simplified version of what we do. And here's, again, that picture of, of, of these individual atoms. Um, and these individual atoms are on top of that chip, and I didn't show you the best part. This chip, um, uh, it has about 100 electrodes, and we have controllers and lasers, <laughs> and the chip is right in there. <laughs> now, the, all the action is here. This is all support, uh, but this is, the, uh, this, um, I don't want to say it's noisy. We think about it, but that, that uh, sorry, went, went a little too fast. Uh, and that little cubic meter is where all the action happens. And we even have visions to scale up those, those boxes uh, by using optical fibers. Again, this is, this is lurching into the science fiction area of my research, but um, we have working prototypes that work with small numbers of qubits. Um, and this is what you have to think of, of course, when you see that system. We're at the level where the things are really, really complicated still. Um, and and uh, you know, these systems are very hard to maintain. Um, but nobody's tried yet to, to engineer these individual atoms, and we're trying to do that both at, uh, in my university research group and also our, our small company, INQ. I'm happy to say you may have noticed on a slide I said before, Honeywell uh, Corporation is also investing a lot in this, this, this interesting platform, but it's pretty exotic, and there are other platforms that are more researchy now. Anything that sort of shows quantum coherence, um, uh, individual atoms, individual electrons, if you can isolate them. There's an interesting defect in diamond that makes diamond turn red um, when there's a vacancy of the carbon atom and next door there's a nitrogen atom defect. Those two together make for a very interesting type of qubit. People think about that. It's called NV diamond. So, the, you know, there, there are a lot of ideas out there. And what's, what's, what's the coolest for me is that this field is still in its infancy on the hardware side. And there are just lots of good ideas out there. And so, what, what happens in the future? Well, we turn to Tom Clancy, of course. So he, you know, he, 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 
he and his ghostwriters, they like to read up on modern research and put little zingers in their books. And actually, they, you know, he talks about quantum computing here and there. Um, but his hero actually builds, builds a device that's stable and it's scalable and it works really well. And he's asked, well, how did you manage to do that if it's so hard? He says, because I'm smarter than all the rest. And that's the great thing about this field. There's so many smart young people that may, might not know quantum physics, the math behind it, but, but they can understand the concepts just well enough to maybe think about new systems that can be built. You know, there's wonderful, uh, uh, you know, wonderful um, directions that are out there. It bridges physics, chemistry, mathematics, information theory, computer science, of course, electrical engineering, all forms of engineering. Um, and I, I guess, uh, one of the challenges in this, is this, in this field, and I, I, I'm hoping that I dispel a little bit of that, is that most people are not comfortable with quantum mechanics. Some, of the, some people don't even believe it. They just think it's, a, you know, it's an ivory tower subject. Um, engineers especially. Older generations of engineers that build airplanes. We need these systems engineer, engineers to apply their skills to quantum. They, they won't touch it. It's, it's, it's such, such a goofy theory to them. And I think this culture is starting to change now, um, but there's sort of a gap between universities and industry in this field. I, I often say that universities, at universities are very comfortable with applying quantum physics, but we don't build things. We don't build things that are useful for others to use, like computers. You never build an airplane or a computer at a university. Industry has the opposite problem. They build things. They have systems engineers that have worked 15 years on one thing, perfected it, prototype after prototype, but they're not comfortable with quantum mechanics yet. So there's sort of a gap now in, in this. I think of it as a workforce issue. And uh, for, for that reason, actually, the US government is very interested in this for many reasons. One, one is that um, the, uh, countries, uh, countries throughout the world are, are putting lots of effort into quantum computing. U.S. has mighty industry, we can take risks and so forth, but we don't have that workforce in the middle. So actually Congress this year, is they, they, they unanimous, the House unanimously passed a law called the National Quantum Initiative that would, that would direct agencies to sort of bridge that middle ground, and the Senate will probably act by, by this year's end. And the White House is actually engaged in this. There's an expert in quantum physics in the White House right now who, who is uh, sort of advising uh, and coordinating the agencies, hopefully, in this field. Um, and again, uh, hopefully in 10 or 20 years, you know, this won't be needed. We'll have a culture of folks that are at least comfortable with quantum physics. So don't worry about not understanding it. None of us do. <laughs> but just get comfortable with it, and then when you go home, you can read interesting books and think about the mystical nature of what could be uh, the, the backbone of, of uh, high-performance computing in the future. Thanks for your attention. So. Okay, so um, if anyone has any questions. Oh, I have one right here at the front. Okay. How, how does this relate to the Chinese satellite that we heard had split a photon and uses the positions of this photon in two different locations to transmit indecipherable code? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I, I, I did mention that quantum computers could break codes, but actually quantum information, and you may have gathered from just the background, you can also encode information in a very interesting way because if somebody reads it, they destroy it. Remember rule number two. So there's something called quantum cryptography where you can actually send quantum bits like photons through a fiber or through space. And if somebody reads it, you know in principle that they are eavesdropping. That's kind of neat. So indeed, the Chinese launched a satellite, and it was a marvelous engineering task to send single photons uh, up to the satellite, and they could basically communicate. It wasn't a very fast rate of communication, but they could do it knowing that the communication was secure. So how does this relate to that? Yes, that's an example of something called quantum communication. I will say, on the other hand, the direct use of qubits for encryption is not necessarily so interesting because if you want to break, if, if you want to, if you want to spy on the person uh, 
sending information from here to the satellite, I would not, maybe not break, try, to, try to intercept it along the line. I would look behind the back of the guy who typed in the information <laughs> or try to blackmail him maybe or, or do something on the satellite at the other end when it gets read. So, you know, those problems are still there. Uh, it does solve the problem of the channel itself being broken, but there's always an element at either end. And in fact, this country is not necessarily so interested in quantum cryptography for that reason. <laughs> um, but it's a marvelous engineering feat, and I, would, I'll give, uh, I will say that if you share photons with, say, many parties, there are protocols that can take advantage of it. This is more in game theory. So you could imagine having an election system where nobody trusts anybody else. How can you be sure there's a fair election? There's a way to use entanglement maybe to help in that direction. So it's, it's, it's very researchy. But the Chinese satellite, I mean, is a very expensive and beautiful engineering project. It also made a lot of noise, and I think that's the design. They, they wanted to you know, really, really uh, kind of uh, make, make, make a lot of press out of that. I have another one over here in the aisle. Um, I'm just curious, it's, it sounds as if you're talking about it as what I would consider the extremely low level of hardware, as if you're talking about, okay, here, here we can take a quantum analogy for a, a computer gate uh, and sort of, sort of logic gate, but of course computers, uh, you know, you build a CPU out of multiple gates and you have the memory and you have, then you have on top of that, you have software. So it seems like there's, um, maybe I'm one of those slightly older engineers who's just uncomfortable with all this, but it seems like there's a huge gap between what you described and what I would think of as, as even anything approaching software. Like, how does that, where does that come in? <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, there's a huge gap. So, so when I think of software, I, I, um, in, in quantum, I think of applying individual gates. I mean, that is really low level. I mean, in classical software, we're, I mean, I, I remember doing a little bit of assembly language code in the 70s, and that was very low level, but the gates behind it are even much lower, very hardware driven. So you're absolutely right. There's a huge gap between what we can do at hardware and the highest level, say, the cloud user interface. However, in these quantum systems, like any computer, if you can abstract away the hardware, whether, whether we have superconducting loops going one direction or another, or atoms that are, that are in one state or another. Um, if you can abstract even just to the gate level, that's very powerful. And there are currently lots of software people, even Mi Microsoft's probably leading the charge, developing quantum software. It's still very low level. And right now you can't cheat, you can't throw away memory like we, like we do these days. You have to really squeeze out every piece of efficiency you can. Um, but you're absolutely right, and we're, we're dying for, for the hardware to graduate so that we can add more software layers to it. That's, that's going to be absolutely necessary. But yes, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, you know, I, I agree with you entirely that we're, <laughs> we haven't even started on the software side yet. Thanks. Um, I guess I don't, um, I have a trouble understanding what the scaling dimension of this is. Like in the ordinary, uh, uh, in the, say, the non quantum computation, uh, we scale on space. That is, we, you know, we can get down to atom levels and, and we just do a kind of an arbitrary computation unit. Uh, um, in a smaller space, right? Uh, but what makes two quantum computers uh, uh, different from each other in terms of scale? Like once you get one of these things working, how do you get the next step that is the, the, the 2.0 version? <laughs> how is that going to be faster than the first one? Hmm. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> that question has lots of, lots of directions. Um, so, just the number of qubits is, in a sense, you get to exponentiate that number or take it to, to the end. So two to the n is, in a sense, the naive power of n qubits. So every time you add one qubit, you've doubled the power of that system, in a sense. Um, the, pr the problem is every time, every time you add a qubit, the system gets a little more messy and you have to probably operate more gates 
So as you make the system bigger, you have to also go deeper. You have to have deeper circuits. And here's, here's the real challenge, as I see it in the laboratory, is that quantum systems, when you make them big, they become classical. They get, they get noticed. <laughs> it's very challenging to scale up a system and maintain quantum coherence. And that's the central challenge in the, whole, in the entire endeavor. Now, one thing I didn't talk about, I, I wish I had time, um, is the idea of quantum error correction. And it turns out if you make your quantum system big enough, it can be stable against errors and you can scale it up. Unfortunately, the overhead to store a really good qubit might require 10,000 plain qubits. Uh, classically, we have error correction as well, but it's much more efficient. You can, you can make the errors go infinitesimally small just by adding a tiny bit more redundancy in how you encode. But there's so many new types of errors that can happen in quantum. You have to encode things in a mass, massive entangled state. But um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but uh, the scale up of quantum computing depends on the algorithm. It, it, it depends on the system. And again, I sort of revert to my earlier answer. We're, it's such an early stage. Um, we just want to build one that can do something demonstrably different than what we could do classically. Maybe that factoring algorithm applied to a small number and think about scaling that up. Or maybe some simulation of some molecular dynamics and see if you can scale that up. So I hate to be wishy-washy, but boy, we still don't know what, what quantum computers are good for. <laughs> it's a slightly peripheral question, but say quantum computers are realized and killer app being factoring uh, large numbers is a solvable problem. Um, the peripheral question is, since so much of our uh, secure, computer security type protocols are based on that, um, can you say anything about as quantum computing develops in 20 years, 50 years, whatever the number is, can you say anything about the directions that um, computer security is going that is not based on that breakable um, encoding. Yeah, good, good point. Um, and just like quantum cryptography, this decryption application is a little overstated because there are uh, cryptographic schemes that, that can be proven quantum can't break. It's called post-quantum cryptography. And, and NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is developing several of those that the government will use. I'm sure NSA is way ahead. <laughs> um, uh, so, so indeed, I, I find the factoring problem, you know, not so interesting. I mean, it, it's academically interesting because it's a different complexity class of a very classic problem. But the application of factoring, there's not much there because we, cannot, we will change our cryptography standards in the coming, maybe in a decade or something. Um, but it's still true that people are listening in right now and writing down ciphertext they can't break. And, and maybe in 20 years they can break it. So if you want to keep a secret more than 20 years, uh, you, you should be careful right now, start taking action now. So, so in, indeed, I th I, I'm not an expert in cryptography, but uh, there are many different, many different forms of cryptography that seem to be quantum, uh, quantum secure. I'm not a techie, but the other night I was listening to a report on uh, various currencies, and they were discussing Bitcoin and others. So is the Bitcoin, uh, what, what you mentioned just now, is it uh, fell, for, I mean, what was that last expression you mentioned just now? Crypto what? C quantum crypto, secure. Crypto, crypto secure. Yeah. I mean, is the Bitcoin crypto secure? Ah, boy, I wish I knew more about that, but the, the, the the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are based on this, this blockchain protocol that, um, as far as I understand, it's very much related to the classic type of cryptography based on the ability to factor. And if you can factor, you can maybe mine Bitcoins. <laughs> um, I, I, think that, I think that's true, but it, I don't think it has to be true. I think you can adopt different standards for, for cryptocurrencies that are also quantum secure. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually not the guy to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those terms. Everybody talks about it, but nobody understands it. 
I have, a, I have a device question for you. I'm looking at the, uh, you had one picture of the IBM system with the superconducting circuits. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like those are Josephson junctions. Can you kind of describe the physics of those? Oh, yeah. Um, a Josephson junction, so the basic loop of wire here, um, it has inductance and capacitance, it's an oscillator. So the, the, the circuit oscillates. If you add a Josephson junction in there, it becomes nonlinear. And therefore, you can store, you can make a qubit out of it. Uh, an oscillator has infinitely many levels, quantum levels. But to, to store a qubit, you need to make the levels differently spaced. And the Josephson junction does that. So it's a little, um, it's, the Josephson junction is this, this little thing there. It's a tiny gap uh, where the electrons tunnel through the gap. And that gives the nonlinearity. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit technical, but that, uh, so, some people in that field would call this thing an atom. They call that big, and if it's a big atom, it can be a tenth of a millimeter on the side. It's an atom. It has a very simple degree of freedom. Everything else is frozen out because it's at, it's at nearly zero degrees Kelvin. It's, 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 it's in a dilution refrigerator, very low temperature. And everything freezes out except this one degree of freedom. So um, Josephson junctions actually were popular in the 80s for making a new type of conventional computer, classical computer, based on Josephson junctions because there was very little dissipation. And it was thought that was important. It turned out not to be. As silicon got smaller and smaller, they just engineered the heck out of it, and you know, silicon conquered. But yeah, I, I have no been involved in that project, actually. Pardon me? You did? I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's no surprise that I, I should have included Northrop Grumman here. IBM and Northrop Grumman now have sort of legacy Josephson computing groups. Maybe you were uh, involved with some of them, maybe older TRW that went over to Northrop. And these same people are now making circuits for quantum. So it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very active field, very exciting. This may be a little mystical, but um, there's- Come on, this is Santa Fe. <laughs> Come on, give it to me. So the human, the human mind is pretty good, pretty smart. And there's a handful of well-respected physicists and others like Penrose and Hameroff, who in fact think that the human brain is a quantum computer. And I know there are issues with how that can be, but I'm just wondering what your thought is on that. <laughs> wow. My, my gut feeling is that um, something hot, sticky, and wet is no place for quantum physics. <laughs> um, so I find it hard to believe, uh, but I, I, I wish I could say, say, say more to it. There are many biological effects that seem to have quantum coherence at their core. One is the uh, one is the rhodopsin in the back of your eye it can detect helicity of single photons. Um, and there's the magnetic field sensing of certain birds that apparently they can, they can detect it at the single atom level of magnetism. Um, and so uh, quantum coherence and even superposition could play a role. The problem is rule number two always gets in the way. When you have something hot or when you have something that's super big, how, does, how, does, how, how can you think of quantum in that context? And, you know, there are really interesting ideas out there. I, th I think it's fascinating. I think it's a little bit fringe, which is too bad. I think they're, you know, shouldn't be you shouldn't be ostracized for, for thinking that way. Um, but I, I just don't know how to think that way. I'm, I'm, uh, if you've gathered, the, the platform I like are individual atoms, you know, 10 or 20, that's a lot. So I'm, I'm sort of a bottom up kind of, kind of person. And it's very hard for me to think of qu applying quantum to a really complex system with 10 to the 20 atoms in it. So yeah, sorry, but <laughs> it's not mystical. I, I think that's it's really interesting, and, and yeah, I think biology is kind of the one of the frontiers of science right now. If we could only link it with physics more, it'd be great. Actually, next month's lecture, Michelle will talk maybe a little in that direction. <laughs>